Hello there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages. Time then to see what's making the headlines with the PR consultant and Conservative candidate in the upcoming general election, Alex Dean, and the journalist and broadcaster, Jenny Kleeman. Welcome to both of you, with us from now until just before midnight. Uh, to the front pages then, let us start with the mirror. It leads with Alan Bates giving evidence at the Horizon IT post office inquiry, describing his decades-long war. Uh, with this quote, thugs in suits running the post office. The Financial Times reports that social media giant Meta and OpenAI are on the brink of putting out advanced AI models with reasoning and planning abilities. The eye leads with a warning from Labour. Public finance mess prevents spending spree after the next election. The Guardian highlights a new report claiming that thousands of children questioning their gender identity are being let down by the NHS. Well, the Times quotes the chairwoman of that NHS review, who says the field of medicine on this is built on shaky foundations. And meanwhile, the Daily Mail's headline on that report, at last, a voice of sanity on children and trans dogma. Meanwhile, rats infest NHS wards is the headline for the Metro, reporting that thousands of rats, cockroaches, wasps and lice were found in hospitals over the past three years. Princess Anne's son, Peter Phillips, is splitting up with his girlfriend, according to The Sun. A reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's newspapers while you watch us. But let's head to our guests then, shall we? Jenny Kleeman, Alex Dean, welcome to both of you. Jenny, three of the newspapers leading on this big review into trans services, effectively. Uh, and the Times, first of all, everyone's got a slightly different take, haven't they? Let's look at the Times. Uh, their suggestion is that an entire field of medicine and enabling children to change their gender has been built on shaky foundations. So tell us about this review. So this is the Cass review, yeah. Dr Hilary Cass, who was a former president of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health. She was commissioned by NHS England in 2020 to look at the evidence base for how the NHS was treating children who have gender dysphoria, who feel uh, uncomfortable in, in their own bodies and, uh, and have gender dysphoria. And uh, what she was looking at, Hilary Cass, was not necessarily about a person's right to transition, uh, but about the evidence base for what is best practice in helping, and particularly children, people who haven't gone through puberty yet, who are still working out who they, who they are. And this has been four years in the making. There was an interim report uh, that came out in February 2020, uh, which led to the Tavistock, which is the gender identity clinic, where most children in England were, were referred to. That has been shut down. The service has, has been uh, spread out uh, to lots of different places. Also, puberty blockers are no longer being... Um, prescribed. So we kind of knew what the headlines of this report would be from that interim report, but it's coming out in full tomorrow. And it just shows that doctors were doing things like uh, prescribing puberty blockers, which they thought would just pause puberty, that would have no sort of long-term effect. But in fact, there was not enough evidence to suggest that that was a good idea to do that. Um, that also doctors were not looking at things holistically. There is a, in the Venn diagram of children who have gender dysphoria, there are a large number of, of children who have other conditions, mental health conditions, or who are autistic. They weren't really looking at uh, the sort of full circumstances. Mm -hmm. They were just looking at children who, who say they feel uncomfortable uh, with their gender and, and then helping them to transition. And the problem with this debate, as we all know, is that it's so incredibly polarised and that you have parents of very troubled children or children who are, by definition, unhappy, because that's what, what dysphoria is, who had been told by a lot of activist charities that um, if the child is to go through puberty, it'll be so distressing that they are likely to feel suicidal. And so, of course, these parents are going to be pressuring the NHS to do whatever they can uh, to, to stop that. Meanwhile, you, you have, according to all of this, an NHS that was far too willing to prescribe those drugs and make those interventions uh, when perhaps that wasn't in the best interests of the child. Uh, there wasn't enough evidence, that's what this review says. Yes, and that has been critical, hasn't it? At what age you give these drugs that stop the, the, the natural progression of children uh, and at what age 
a child actually realises what their gender identity should be. And as the Times puts it, the NHS Review has rejected the use of these puberty blockers. Yeah, I mean, it says what I think a lot of people would have thought from the beginning of this debate, which is it's very difficult until you have puberty to really know about your sexuality. And indeed, one of the groups that's um, been opposing the Tavistock-style activity within the NHS for children has been gay activists who've said, well, actually, it's very likely that many of these young people are actually gay and you're eff effectively giving them treatment to change their gender and therefore avoid being homosexual. Now, the other thing I think is important about this is that uh, Dr Cass uh, concludes, for most people, a medical pathway will not be the best way to manage their gender-related distress. I think most people will have thought that right from the beginning of this whole discussion. And it's worth remembering, the NHS started conducting puberty blocker and other um, gender-related treatments for children in 2011. We're going to have a generation of children now who later on may have claims about what will happen to them, or to put it pejoratively, what was done to them. These are children, remember, not fully informed. They're not fully able to give consent to what happens to them in the way that an adult is. What was done to them in what we've now concluded in the best possible review, I think, by the, by the appropriate expert, shouldn't have happened in the first place. Well, the Daily Mail does that at last moment yes. that you're expressing there, a voice of sanity on children and trans dogma. The Guardian, meanwhile, says thousands of children unsure of their gender identity are being let down by the yes. NHS. You, you've worked on this, what, for about a decade now? Yes. You've been to talk to some of these people in the Tavistock. What were your conclusions as you did your own research into this? Well, I mean, I, I, I did a report... Um, about I, I did a long a long form feature about children transitioning. It was in either 2014 or 2015, back at the time when you could actually um, ask questions and not be involved in a, in a giant culture war about it. And I interviewed people from the Tavistock, and there was a range of opinions there. The one thing that I noticed was that they were all very aware that the people who came to the Tavistock, the families who came, had been on a waiting list for a long time, and during that time, they had all... Um, absorbed lots of messages from uh, the internet or from um, charities that had, had made it very clear that it would be really dangerous for their child to go through a, a natural puberty. And it need, we need dangerous to be Dangerous because they, they might self-harm, Yes, you mean. because they might self-harm. And as a parent, you would find that terrifying. As a child, you would find it terrifying. You'd also find it terrifying if you, if you feel uncomfortable and then you're hearing that going through puberty is going to be a horrific thing for you. You would want to block it. And I think it's important that, we, that we're clear here that puberty blockers is different from cross-sex hormones. So it's different from taking the hormones of... of, of the, of the opposite sex that will yeah. cause a... So this a simply halts your own adolescence. It, 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 well, at the time, they thought that it, it was just a neutral pause right. that would just allow you time to think, which is, which is the famous phrase. But, in fact, nothing not is neutral. Nothing like that is neutral, because whilst all your peers are going through puberty and you're not, it's not neutral. And it's also what research that has been done shows that those who go on these blockers, very few of them end up not taking cross-sex hormones. It is a kind of pathway... Um, to transition. And it's a complex issue. It's, it's just such a shame that having a, a nuanced discussion for the sake of the, the welfare of children is so difficult because it is so polarised on both sides. There are, there are people who will be gleefully um, receiving this report tomorrow and there will also be some, some yeah. trans families that are really terrified as well, some, some parents of trans kids who don't know what's best for their children now. Mm. Well, I, I see your point about the complexity, but on the other hand... I don't think as a matter of principle many of us will think it's complex. Adults are free. I mean, it's a question about whether the state should do it for you, but adults are free to make all sorts of decisions about, about themselves and their bodies. Children, on the other hand, are in no position, I think, to make a realistic or genuine uh, consenting process to this, and in, especially when the science was so uncertain. And it, it's actually... It, it, because of the toxicity of the debate, which um, the report identifies and we've all, yeah. we all acknowledge, mm. th this has been going on longer than it should have been anyway. The Tavistock alone and the trust it responsible uh, for this activity treated more than 9,000 children. I mean, it's extraordinary. But they, were it, they were totally overwhelmed. And the, the flip side that isn't really pro often discussed in all of this is that, yes, children might not be able to decide what's best for them, but the children who were being referred there were in crisis and were desperately unhappy. The point is what the pathway that they were put on, there wasn't a proper evidence base for, and it would have 
potentially been catastrophic for many of them. Sure. But I feel for those the, for those families, we might say, you know, it, it's obvious what the right thing must be, but if you're in that situation and you have a child that's going through all of this, I imagine it's, it's, it's a terrifying thing to go through and still is because we still don't really know what no, the no, right thing to do should be. That's a completely fair point. But what I, I didn't mean to pretend, and I don't think I came across as suggesting the, the needs of these children are anything other than complex, but the, the point is that saying there's a magic bullet and the magic yeah. bullet is changing your gender by the thousand, but my, my you, not one or two, by the thousand. That's where we've gone so wrong as a society. And I think the natural... If you take this report to its conclusion, which is there's no good evidence for giving this... Um, yeah, the shaky foundation. No good evidence for giving these transitioning drugs to children. We failed these children that, that received us. it. Yeah. Yes. Well, the, yeah, the three bullet points, uh, the red uh, squares you can see for the male, pillars of gender treatment built on shaky foundations, caution is, should be needed before youngsters change pronouns, and evidence severely lacking over the use of puberty blockers, which is what the Times yes. went with. Just on the middle one yes. there, children changing their pronouns, names and clothes from a young age could lead to a greater sense of urgency for yes. medical interventions such as puberty, puberty blockers. I mean, this is this also really interesting, because this was initially being seen as, it's you know, it's a neutral thing, just just mm -hmm. give people the pronouns that they want, let them dress however they want, without really thinking that if you are a teenager and you have made this big statement, I want to be known by uh, different pronouns and I'm, I'm dressing differently, mm -hmm. that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that is so oh. difficult for you to, to roll back from. I mean, all of this is so, is so sensitive and difficult. But it's also, I, I think we have to also roll back from the idea that this is some sort of fad as well from, for, from some sort of children, from some children. It is such a difficult thing that so many families are in uh, and it's good that there is some nuance now, that there has been this report that is very detailed and, and very thoughtful that we can pull out the conclusions from. There will be pages and pages and yeah. much yeah. discussion about it. There already is yeah. um, everywhere. Let's look at the Daily Mirror now, shall we? Uh, Mr Bates versus the thugs in suits. Um, you know, the man at the centre of this ITV drama, Alan Bates, um, appearing before the post office inquiry, didn't intend for this to be my last 20 years, saying that... From about 2009, he's been working on it for 30 to 40 hours a week and has not been uh, employed effectively since he lost his post office in, I think it was 2003. Yeah, and asked at the end, what are you going to do after this? Is oh, I just might buy myself a little post office. I mean, <laughs> absolutely fantastic to be able to, after all this, to maintain even a dark sense of humour. Yes. Extremely admirable. Um, this man has, I think, achieved a great deal for a number of people who have been wronged by our system. I... I I know that Parliament as a whole, it's not a party political point, Parliament was trying to do the right thing by passing an act saying, basically, let's undo all of this. I'm not sure that gives the individuals the sense of justice that they uh, want. You, it may be impossible to give them individually their day in, in court, but what he's pushing for isn't primarily about money. It's about a sense of justice and vindication, mm. and I think they deserve that. And actually... Just a blanket from Parliament's probably not going to be enough because they were individually tried and dragged through courts. Often when these systems were faulty and the people concerned with the prosecutions had a firm sense that not, not all was right with it. Yeah, I know you want to come in. I haven't, I haven't got time. Just a fantastic picture there on the front page yes. of the Times of Mr Bates. I don't know if that's the moment where he was joking about yeah. the, uh, the small post office or where the photographers were asking him to remove his hat. I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, a, a very interesting day and, and lots more to come, has to be said, at that post office inquiry. Um, plenty more next here on our press preview, uh, including this on the front of the Financial Times. Its headline, Rwanda State Airline turned down a role in Sunak asylum plan over brand fears. We will discuss that in just a moment. Welcome back. You are watching the press preview, joined once again by the journalist and broadcaster Jenny Kleeman and the PR consultant and now Conservative candidate in the upcoming general election, Alex Dean, the man who has the longest title that I've out, I think. <laughs> Uh, anyway, let's go to the Financial Times, shall we? Uh, Rwanda, uh, presumably coming back next week in Parliament. Uh, we certainly had a meeting today between Mr Sunak and the Rwandan president, did we not, in Downing Street. And here is a story about Rwanda's state-owned airline turned down uh, a role in the asylum plan because of brand fears. Yeah, so Rwanda Air, which I think is quite a cleverly named airline, is getting lots of free publicity uh, this week for not doing something. And what they've done is say they're not going to take part in the flights. The, the irony here is, as you've 
pointed out in your introduction, they are completely owned by the Rwandan government. <laughs> I mean, you must be quite annoyed. I mean, it's fine. It, you know, British Airways now does what it wants, and it's in the private sector. But for your own airline not to follow through on government policy, which Rwanda continues to say it's, it's proud of and wants to, to have, um, it is a bit of a slap in uh, the face. And so the government's going to be left thinking, how are we going to get people to Rwanda? Because, of course, this is not the only airline to say they won't do it. Yes, well, how are they going to get people to Rwanda and where are people going to stay? Because the front of, of, of today's times was about, uh, about uh, the places where uh, Suella Braverman was posing outside of, uh, being sold off. Um, it's a kind of nightmare. The clock is ticking on Rishi Sunak's self-imposed deadline of saying that there's going to be flights to yeah. Rwanda this spring. When this spring? When does when is the latest that you can say spring is? There's going to be ping pong, House of Lords, House of Commons, t to get it through. Who's going to fly them? Where are they going to stay? The, I mean, I personally feel that this entire strategy has been a gimmick from start to finish, an incredible waste of money, and increasingly looks unworkable. Well, it's a deterrent, isn't it? If you, well, if you that, say if that. that's your title for a gimmick, yeah, but that is the do point you, of it. Do you mean you think it's going because the government... I'm just trying to... Do you think because the government prefers to have the argument to it than to actually have the policy? You think it's a helpful political... I think it is a, a good way of saying, we're doing something. Here is a country what we're going to put them, rather than saying, you know what, we're going to clear the backlog and process these things yeah. and, and send people, as soon as they arrive, we'll but send so them the and we'll cooperate with be, our... Even if you get a few flights going, people who come to the... And it'll be very eye-catching as a policy. Let's agree whether people are for it or against it, that those who are running people smuggling rings might well be asked by their potential but customers... Two stories. OK, uh, all might right. Well, asked, uh, might I wind up in Rwanda? I, I OK, was, two yeah. quick stories. I'm going to uh, read one out loud. Uh, I haven't got time to talk about it. Okay. The Guardian... Ministers announce a shoplifting crackdown. Uh, this has caused real concern, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, waves of shoplifting. And also causing concern, presumably, is the metro. Rats infest NHS wards and other creatures, to be fair, as well. Yes, disgusting. Lice uh, in uh, children's wards, maternity units, uh, maintenance backlog to repair, rundown buildings has hit £11.6 billion. Pounds. So if you, we didn't have enough to worry about in the yeah. NHS, they're being overrun with okay. pestilence. Oh. Nice, thank you. Jenny Kleeman and Alex Dean, thank you both very much indeed. See you for the 11 as well. Plenty more to discuss. Right now, here's the weather.